Having looked at the phenomenon of recombination, that is the exchange of genetic material producing recombinant chromosomes that occurs between chromatids of homologous chromosomes during meiosis, we can now take um, this phenomenon and apply it to the mapping of genes that are based on recombination frequencies between genes. So we can map the distances, the relative distances between genes based on recombination frequencies. So let's look at an example of that. So here we have three genes, A, B, and C. We don't know the order of the genes on the chromosome, nor do we know the distances between the genes. So we, we make a cross, let's say, of a, of a true breeding double dominant uh, line of individuals to a recessive, double, uh, double recessive individual. We produce a dihybrid, but this time the dihybrid is hybrid for alleles of genes on the same chromosome. And now we do a test cross, whereby these heterozygous individuals are crossed to homozygous recessive individuals. That's the definition of a test cross. And we do that because the chromosomes produced by this dihybrid will reveal to us their genotypes when they are placed over the chromosomes inherited from the double recessive parent because either recessive alleles or dominant alleles will show up over these recessive alleles inherited from the double recessive parent. So let's see how that might work in fact. So let's look at this for a moment. So if we have big A and little a and big B and little b in the dihybrid, let's say, and we cross this to little a, little a, little b, little b, this is our test cross to our double recessive, then we can examine what type of chromosomes emanate from this individual and the frequencies with which they do so by looking at what phenotypes we get out of this. So if a is dominant to little a and b, big b is dominant to little b, we can see that if we inherit a big A, big B chromosome from this parent, and a, this parent can only contribute little a, little b chromosomes, then this individual would have the phenotype of the dominant phenotype, big A, big B. Whereas if, if an individual inherits a recessive chromosome, double recessive chromosome from the parent on the left, little a, little b, and of course inherits a little a, little b chromosome from the test stock, then this would have the phenotype little a, little b, the re double recessive phenotype. And both of these would represent non-recombinant chromosomes. That is, the original parental arrangement of alleles is intact in this case and in this case as well. So what, what would happen if we have recombination? So let's look at that. So now, if there is a meiosis in which recombination occurs between these, between these genes, Then, and we cross this, of course, to our test stock. Then what we will have is a chromosome which is links big A to little b here, follow the bouncing ball down here. So we would have a chromosome that was big A, little b, over the tester chromosome, which is little a, little b. And this would have the phenotype big A, little b, because we're homozygous for a little b, and we have the dominant allele for the A gene. The reciprocal crossover chromosome would be little a, big b, and that one placed over the tester chromosome, little a, little b, would yield the little a, big b phenotype. And these would then be recombinant phenotypes. They would rec represent recombination between the two genes that we're monitoring here. And the frequency of chromosomes that we get out of this type will be revealed to us by looking at the, the comparative phenotypes. And we can then immediately know that for this phenotype, the genotype was thus, and for this phenotype, the genotype was thus. So let's see how this works. So in this cross, and when we do our test cross of our double heterozygote to our homozygous tester strain, we look at a thousand progeny, let's say, and out of that thousand progeny, 50 are, have the big A, little b phenotype, 
and 50 will have the little a big B phenotype. That is, 100 chromosomes out of 1,000 will be recombinant, and 900 will be non-recombinant. We still have big A linked to big B, or little a linked to little b. So we can calculate then the recombination frequency between the A and B genes as follows. 100 recombinant chromosomes out of 1,000 total it represents a recombination frequency of 0.1. So the map distance is the recombination frequency times 100 to get a percentage, which equals 10%, or 10 centimorgans, or 10 map units. So the distance between A and B is 10 centimorgans, or 10 map units, because the frequency of recombination between the A and B genes was 10%. Likewise, we could do the same for the A and C genes. So we do the same thing for the A and C genes. We test cross. We make an F1 that is doubly heterozygous for the A and C uh, genes, and we do a back cross to double a recessive uh, little a, little c stock, and we find out that we get 80 recombinant chromosomes out of 1,000, which works out to a recombination frequency then of, of 8%, or places the A and C genes 8 centimorgans or 8 map units apart. So A and C map 8 map units apart. Now what about B and C? We do the same thing with B and C. We create a dihybrid between that, that is heterozygous for the, for the B and C uh, alleles and back cross to a tester strain that is doubly recessive for B and C and we find out that we only get 2% recombinant chromosomes. That is 20 out of a 20 out of 1,000. So the distance between B and C works out to two centimorgans, or two map units apart. That is, we have 2% two, two recombinant chromosomes uh, produced here. So B and C are two centimeters apart. A and B were 10 centimeters apart. And A and C were eight centimeters apart. So we can produce a internally consistent map in which A and B are the outside genes here. They are the furthest apart. C lies somewhere between them. In fact, we know that C lies two centimeters away from B and eight centimeters away from A, so that positions C at this position in the chromosome. Now, these, these numbers add up perfectly, but in practice, we often find that that's not true because there can be double recombination events. And we often would measure eight, centimeter, or eight centimorgans here, two centimorgans here, and somewhat less than 10 centimorgans here due to double recombinations that we would not immediately detect. But there are ways to discern that, but that is not the subject for this introductory class. Uh, that's more when you take uh, a little more advanced genetics, we get into um, how to calculate uh, recombination frequencies, taking into account the double recombinant events that can occur between genes, two crossover events, multiple crossovers. So then in human, mapping human genes, we, unlike fruit flies where we're looking at, at a wing, wing shape or eye color, we often map a human disease gene, an allele that causes human disease, to an anonymous marker, such as a DNA marker, that simply is a molecular marker. There's no phenotype other than a change in the DNA associated with that. And we look at the recombination frequency then in families, we find the frequency to which a change in the DNA, like a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is just a basically a, a name for an allelic differences in the DNA that might not have a phenotype in and of its own other than the molecular phenotype that we're observing. So we look at the linkage between or the frequency with which a disease allele is found with a single nucleotide polymorphism or change in the DNA, and we map human disease genes relative to these changes in DNA using the frequency to which they are found together. That is, we're looking kind of at the opposite of recombination between them. We're looking at their association. And if they're tightly associated, then they will, uh, you will find the, the um, disease allele and the uh, particular change in the DNA that you're observing uh, very frequently together because they're not separated by recombination. So that's often what we do in human genome, in, in human gene mapping. And here is a map of uh, the X chromosome. We're showing various diseases that have been mapped to various locations along this chromosome. So as you can see, there's quite a number of 
human disease genes that have been mapped on this chromosome, including hemophilia B, hemophilia A, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a disease uh, caused by a mutant allele that maps to this position. So you can see that human genetic mapping, mapping of diseases is very important in, in allowing us to locate genes on the chromosome and ultimately to study them at the molecular level. And here's a little bit of a joke slide of the Y chromosome. This is a real gene. The SRY gene is the um, gender determining gene in mammals. And SRY, if you have it, if you have a Y chromosome and have an intact SRY gene, you will develop as a male. A mammal will develop as a male. Whereas if, they, if a mammal, if a mammalian embryo lacks the SRY gene, usually by lacking a Y chromosome, then it will develop as a female. But these are other joke, ha ha ha, joke uh, genes that we imagine that we could make fun of being on the Y chromosome. So you're welcome to pause the movie here and laugh if you so choose. Now I want to point out that the effects of recombination are to increase genetic variability. So if we imagine in this grand parental generation here, relative to this grandson down here, if we imagine that we could paint the homologous chromosomes in the grandfather here, say, and the homologous chromosomes in the grandmother. Let's imagine we take one of the chromosome sets and paint one red here and one yellow here and one dark blue and one light blue. And then look at what the offspring of these grandparents have in terms of their chromosomes. We see that all their offspring will inherit chromosomes that are recombinant from the mother. That is our, a combination, a unique combination of what was, were the alleles on the red and the yellow chromosomes due to recombination that occurs in the meioses of this, uh, this individual here, this female individual. Whereas the same will hold true for the chromosomes inherited from the father because of recombination that will occur in the meioses, in the gonads of this uh, male here. So that every individual here inherits a unique combination of these two chromosomes due to different recombinations that have been uh, have occurred and have been inherited through the sperm or eggs of this offspring generation. And then let's just take this female here, this parent female here, and look at the what would be the grandson relative to these grandparents here. And she would also exchange genetic material during meiosis between these homologous chromosomes, such that you can see that this grandson here inherits from his mother a chromosome, a member of, the, of a chromosome pair, that has genetic material that was originally present in all four homologous chromosomes of the grandparents. Now, of course, these grandparents have inherited chromosomes from their parents, which are recombinant. We've just chosen to say, let's paint these chromosomes uniformly at this generation so that we can follow through, schematically speaking, in a thought experiment kind of way, what recombination does in terms of reshuffling the genetic material of chromosomes. And we see that, uh, that uh, recombination Genetic crossing over creates new combinations of alleles and shuffles genetic material, and therefore creates a vast amount of genetic variability in any sexually reproducing organisms. And if you couple recombination, crossing over between chromatids of homologous chromosomes, with independent assortment of alleles on different chromosomes, alleles of genes on different chromosomes, this accounts for the vast amount of genetic variability that we find in sexually reproducing natural populations. And this is the stuff of evolution, because evolution can seize upon that vast amount of genetic variability to select uh, combinations, gene combinations, that are best adapted and will reproduce better than other gene combinations. So genetic variability is the, the raw material that natural selection acts upon in evolution. If only Darwin had known about genetics and the, the means by which genetic variability is created, he would have been very excited. Unfortunately, he neither knew the work of Mendel nor of subsequent work which has shown the phenomenon of recombination which creates additional genetic variability even beyond Mendelian, straight Mendelian inheritance that we've, we've uh, talked about so far. So if we apply this to looking at human pedigrees now, let's apply a little genetics here, we see that Generation one here, we have, let's say, a human disease. And we indicate males with squares in human pedigrees and females by circles. And affected individuals, 
uh, that show a mutant phenotype or whatever phenotype it is we're monitoring by shading and non-affected individ individuals by non-shading. So here we have generation one, an affected male who mates with an unaffected female. And we see that his son and her son and the uh, also a female in generation two are affected by the uh, disease that we happen to be following here. And when this male mates outside the family, he produces a daughter that is affected. And when this daughter mates outside the family, she produces two daughters, as it happens, that are affected. So we see here the disease or the trait that we're looking at appearing in every generation, which means that we're dealing with a dominant allele because it doesn't recess for a generation. It appears in every generation. So this is characteristic of a dominant uh, allele. Furthermore, it is found in both males and females, indicating that this is not a sex-linked trait, it is an autosomal trait. So here we have an autosomal dominant pedigree. Here's an example of a recessive pedigree, which we indicate carriers of a disease or a trait with a split uh, symbol here. Um, and, and individuals can be carriers because here we're looking at a recessive allele, which when heterozygous with a normal allele does not result in a mutant a phenotype, it results in a normal phenotype. So. Looking at this pedigree, let's say we have an individual male down here in generation four that presents to, let's say, a human geneticist or a genetic counselor with a particular disease. Well, his pedigree can usually be um, delved into by the genetic counselor or the physician to determine what, where this disease showed up in his lineage. And this, something like this could be worked out whereby a great-grandparent either the male great-grandparent or the female great-grandparent would have been determined to be probably heterozygous for the, um, the disease allele or the trait that we're talking about. But they would not have been, they would have been a carrier, either this male or this female. We don't know which one, so we don't know which one to shade in. But we see that the offspring of this mating here would have produced a female here that was heterozygous for the allele, that is, she was a carrier for the disease or the trait that we're talking about. Since it's recessive, she does not display that phenotype. And if she happens to be unlucky enough to mate with a male who is also heterozygous, a carrier for this disease or this trait, then there's a chance that there will be homozygous individuals produced. Likewise, this carrier male can produce carrier offspring if he mates with a female that is not a carrier. None of their offspring will show the disease, but some of their offspring can be carriers. Now, if a carrier female mates with a carrier male, and uh-oh, what's this? That is consanguineous uh, marriage. That is, this represents, that double line there represents consanguineous mating. San, consanguineous, con with sanguineous blood, consanguineous. And these are first cousins, if you notice, that have married or have at least bred and produced offspring. And that has a very high probability then of producing diseased individuals. This event here is probably pretty rare unless the disease allele is common in the population because the chance of a carrier female mating with a carrier male would be relatively rare unless the, as I've said, that disease, that, that mutant allele was common in the population. But this event can be, is the probability of a homozygous individual occurring is greatly enhanced by consanguineous matings because these two individuals are sharing genes inherited ultimately from their grandparents up here. And therefore the great grandchildren there have, a, have an increased probability of being diseased. So that is why almost universal taboos exist against consanguineous matings. In almost all cultures, there's taboos against this. And it uh, shows that, in fact, there is knowledge of genetics that extend far back into human history, long before um, understanding of genetics was, was thorough. But uh, there was a practical understanding that consanguineous marriages or matings were likely to result in detrimental effects in the offspring. Now, a few rules about doing genetic uh, problems. We have, we have two rules, the rule of addition. And that, we consider the rule of addition uh, when we are, are talking about mutually exclusive events occurring simultaneously. So if we were to cross a 
monohybrid by another monohybrid here. The probability of getting heterozygous individuals in that cross is the probability of obtaining one, the heterozygote one way, time, or plus the probability of obtaining it another way. In other words, if we were to draw our little Punnett square here and look at our monohybrid cross, we would look at big P, little p, big P, little p. We see that these are big P homozygotes, that these are little p homozygotes, and that both of these are heterozygotes. So the probability of getting this heterozygote is one quarter of the progeny. The, pro the probability of getting that heterozygote is also one quarter. And therefore, the probability of getting a heterozygote out of this cross is one quarter plus one quarter equal, plus, sorry, one quarter equals one half. So that's what we have here. One quarter plus one quarter equals one half. And we can see that how we use the rule of addition to calculate the probability of two mutually exclusive events occurring simultaneously. The rule of multiplication occurs when we are looking at independent events occurring simultaneously. And there we multiply their individual probabilities together. So if we were to look at the probability of obtaining a double uh, recessive homozygote from a dihybrid cross, we can calculate the probability without even doing a Punnett square very easily. We know that we can treat these separately so that if we have, let's take first the R alleles here, just consider the R alleles, ignore the Y alleles. We have big R and little r, big R and little r, and the chance of getting a little r homozygote we know is one fourth. And if we do the same thing with the Y alleles here, big Y, little y, big y, little y, the probability of obtaining a homozygous recessive individual for the little y alleles is one quarter. And therefore the chance of getting both little r, little r, and little y, little y is one fourth times one fourth equals one sixteenth. And you know this already. You know that in a dihybrid cross only one sixteenth of the individuals will be little r, little r, little y, little y, knowing that we have a 9, 3, 3, 1 ratio, a classic dihybrid ratio according to Mendelian genetics. But we can calculate that probability very easily by breaking the individual genes out if we're looking at the case of independent assortment and calculate the probability, uh, various probabilities for a genotype, knowing what the probabilities for the genotypes are of the two alleles or the two genes separately. And that's a very practical. Um, the pro that's a very practical way to uh, do these types of genetic problems and to understand what's going on there with the alleles. And I've already f referred to a test cross uh, by crossing to um, a, a homozygous recessive individual, and we call that a test cross. And I can illustrate that as follows: Imagine you have a purple flower. You don't know whether that's due to dominant homozygosity of dominant alleles or a heterozygous genotype. Well, you can discern by crossing this individual what the genotype of this individual was. If you cross to a double recessive um, uh, plant, which only produces little p alleles, and you only get the dominant phenotype in the offspring, then you know that the individual was homozygous for the big p allele. Whereas, if you cross to a homozygous recessive individual and half the offspring have the double recessive phenotype that has both recessive alleles, you know that the individual that you were testing had to be heterozygous for those, um, the, the dominant and recessive alleles. So we call the crossing to a recessive stock a, a test cross, and for very good reason, because the genotypes of the individuals that you're trying to discern are revealed to you by looking at the offspring of a cross to a homozygous recessive stock, whatever it is, um, whatever organism it is that you're dealing with. So we've been through uh, a little adventure in genetics and we've shown that the, meiosis, the gene mapping and meiosis inheritance connection is well established in the chromosome theory of inheritance. Here's shown a very nice figure of scanning electron micrographs of a human Y chromosome condensed at metaphase and a human X chromosome condensed at metaphase. And what we'd like to do now, just for the, the short while, briefly, is to talk about some human genetic disorders. And some genetic disorders 
we know are caused by mutations in DNA that cause defective proteins to be produced by a particular gene. But other genetic disorders are caused by a change in the number of chromosomes. So it's those disorders right now that I'd like to focus on. And one of the uh, mechanisms by which chromosome number can be altered to a detrimental way, to a detrimental result, is called non-disjunction. And that can result during meiosis of producing gametes that have one too many or one too few chromosomes. And then if you have fertilization of those gametes by a normal um, other gamete, then that can result in trisomy or monosomy for particular chromosomes. And one of the cases uh, in which there's a pathology associated with this is Down syndrome caused by trisomy for chromosome 21. So, Let's look at how that, let's briefly review how that might occur. So let's look at how, um, or let's review rather how non-disjunction can produce trisomy for particular chromosomes. Imagine that we have a replicated homologous chromosome pair here, and that during the first meiotic division, this is in a cell entering meiosis, in the first meiotic division, what happens instead of the homologous chromosomes normally separating and going to opposite poles, we imagine that they go to the same pole. So if that's the case, we end up with a daughter cell at the end of meiosis 1, which has two replicated chromosomes, and another daughter cell which has neither. That was meiosis 1. And then in meiosis 2, where the chromatids separate in a, a mitotic-like fashion, again we end up with two daughter cells here which lack any member of that chromosome set and here we end up with two daughter cells with two of the chromosomes that we happen to be considering here because the chromatids have separated and gone to opposite poles in meiosis 2 here. Well imagine that one of these gametes now is fertilized by let's say a sperm, let's say these are eggs, and is fertilized by a sperm that carries the normal one copy of that chromosome. It is haploid with respect to that chromosome. Well, when this sperm now joins with this egg, we end up with a zygote that with, with respect to the chromosome that we're talking about, there are three copies of that chromosome. And this is what we would call trisomy for that particular chromosome. There are three members of that chromosome set instead of the normal two. So we have trisomy for that particular chromosome. We're tri in other words, we're trisomic for that particular chromosome. And this is what results in, uh, this is what produces Down syndrome, which is trisomy for chromosome 21. And as we've discussed, if you look at maternal age in mammals, and humans in particular, we're studying here, versus the frequency of Down syndrome, we see that it's pretty level up until about age 35, and then there's an increase in the incidence of Down syndrome. And that's because mammalian females are born with all the eggs they will ever have when they are born as infants. And, it's, and the eggs are frozen in, not frozen literally, but they are quiescent, they are stopped, they are paused in meiosis 1. And their homologous chromosomes have been replicated and are just um, waiting to be brought out of meiosis when the mammalian individual, in the case of human females, the, the female reaches sexual maturity, at which time she starts maturing one egg per cycle, per monthly cycle. And um, so at age 35, those chromosomes have been held in a quiescent state, joined together for a long period of time, and it, it, it's clear that at age 35, there is an increase in the frequency of non-disjunction. And we see that as an increase in the frequency of Down syndrome um, offspring due to non-disjunction in females. There's no correlation between male age, at paternal age in other words, and the frequency of non-disjunction as revealed by Down syndrome. Now, trisomy for other chromosomes also will increase, but th those usually are lethal, though always they are lethal. And it's only uh, trisomy for chromosome 21 trisomy for chromosome 21 that produces viability and Down syndrome um, babies that often survive into their 20s, rarely beyond age 30. So here is a karyotype of a Down syndrome individual. We have normal chromosome pairs, 
It's a male. This happens to be a male. He has an X and a Y chromosome, but he, he was trisomic or is trisomic for chromosome 21. There are three copies produced here. Here's an interesting case. Look at this. Here's the mother's karyotype. Here's the father's karyotype. And this was a sponta spontaneously aborted, that is natural abortion, of um, a fetus. And uh, cytogenetics was done to see what might have caused the uh, miscarriage of this fetus at a relatively late stage, about five weeks, six weeks of pregnancy. And we see that there are three chromosomes for every set, for every chromosome set. So in a way, this individual is trisomic for every chromosome set. We call an individual like this, we call a karyotype like this, not trisomic, but triploid. There are three sets of chromosomes for all the chromosome, um, all the homologous chromosome sets. This was a female in that there's no Y chromosome. So she was a female, but she was trisomic, or she was, I'm sorry, she was triploid for all chromosome sets. Now you could say, well, maybe there was non-disjunction, chromosomal non-disjunction for all the chromosomes simultaneously in a meiosis of, um, let's say, the female parent, most likely the female parent. But that would be very, very unlikely that we would have non-disjunction for every single chromosome set to produce an egg that had two copies of every chromosome set and was fertilized by a normal sperm. Much more likely is the probability that this is in a case of polyspermy, where two normal sperm both fertilize a normal egg and we get a triploid as a result. And of course, these are always lethal. They, they are spontaneously aborted by, through natural causes. And non-disjunction with increased maternal age is why amniocentesis is recommended or chorionic villi sampling is recommended for human females that become pregnant after, at or after age 35. In amniocentesis, amniotic fluid is withdrawn and the cells that are sloughed off by the fetus are taken out of that fluid and are um, grown in culture and karyotyped looking for trisomy, uh, uh, particularly of trisomy of chromosome 21, to look for potential future Down syndrome uh, babies. And amniocenti or I'm sorry, chorionic villi sampling can be done much earlier, in which case the chorionic villi, which have the uh, genotype of the zygote of the fetus, are uh, present. And um, so you can do chorionic villi sampling earlier and obtain a karyotype for the fetus uh, very early. And that is highly recommended for human females who become pregnant at 35 or over due to the non-disjunction phenomenon. Now, when we have non-disjunction of sex chromosomes, we can get a syndrome of traits that are associated with abnormal sex chromosome number. So, for example, if we have a non-disjunction event in an egg, in the production of an egg in which an egg has two X chromosomes, or which an egg has null X chromosome, zero, and those are fertilized by either X-bearing or Y-bearing sperm coming in from the male, this could result in triple X if the sperm bore an X chromosome, or an XXY Kleinfelter syndrome male. It's male because it has a Y chromosome, but it's a feminized male because there are two X chromosomes. The opposite of that is Turner syndrome in which we have one X chromosome that is brought in by the sperm and zero X chromosomes brought in by the egg. That results in Turner syndrome. These are females because there's no Y chromosome, but they um, develop, uh, the reproductive system develops abnormally. And there are other uh, defects associated with the Turner syndrome. Same with Kleinfelder syndrome males. They are usually feminized males, which um, are sterile and usually don't uh, have normal um, internal uh, male reproductive structures. And the zero Y offspring are non-viable. So that is where we will leave off. This is where we will leave off. and. Uh, in our next lecture, we will talk a little bit more about human um, uh, disorders, human genetic disorders, before moving on to the structure of DNA.